Hello, I'm Ed Kraft. I'm pastor of Christ Fellowship. We're in Ringo, Georgia. And um, we've completed an Easter season, which was sort of like a not Easter season. But in any case, we're in the post-Easter season. And after Lent and after Easter comes a season of Pentecost. So that we're moving toward, uh, in the scriptures, the moving of the power of the Holy Spirit upon the church to make the church what it ought to be. And so that's coming uh, in Acts 2 in Pentecost. But as we prepare for that, we're moving toward Acts chapter 1. If you'll go there with me in the scriptures, I want to make sure that you keep praying for several folks in our congregation. One of those would be uh, Eric, a son-in-law of Tony and Doris, who's undergoing treatment and um, chemotherapy not easy and we're praying for him and his family as well and then my wife Ruby who had a bad fall and had a shoulder separation and a replacement and so she's at home today watching or at least you need to be watching Ruby if you're not and so she's there and uh, keep praying for them there are other members of our congregation I'm sure who would request prayer if they were here we're doing everything like many churches are at least online and so we are live online on Facebook. So if you would like, you can go there, uh, make a comment, etc. And um, uh, make your own comment of whatever you'd like to say. We'll review that after the message. I'm going to Acts chapter 1. And um, if you will, understand that we have a picture here of Jesus Christ having resurrected, come from the dead in his glorified body. And he is uh, viewing with his disciples in these days, some 40 days following the resurrection. In the first book, O Theophilus, this is Luke writing, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, the, the original language here has to do with fellowshipping with them, eating with them, um, sitting together with them and talking. I'd like to have been in on that conversation. And so while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, he means John the baptizer. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. In essence, what Acts 1 tells us that Jesus in his appearance, of resurrection appearance with his disciples, uh, eating with them, staying with them, talking with them for 40 days following his resurrection, uh, that's a whole lot of appearances. Paul lists six appearances in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, the New Testament lists something like 15 or 16 appearances, but... In 40 days, how many appearances would that be after the resurrection? And the point being this, that Jesus alive promises the power of the Holy Spirit upon His church. And so Christ promises literally His ongoing presence by means of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, those three persons of the Trinity. We'll talk more about that as we go along, but just so you understand this, there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And so in that light, Jesus Christ lived in His ministry by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
the Spirit of God empowered and also appointed his ministry in those three years before the crucifixion. Now Jesus Christ in his resurrection body comes and says, the Spirit of God is going to come upon you and he will take charge over his church and over his believers. And so out of the supernatural resurrection of Jesus comes the promise of presence. Spiritual, real, dynamic, powerful presence. That's who the Holy Spirit is. So hereafter, when we think in terms of God, we must recognize the personal presence of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because they are different, but they are completely cooperative and unified. There is this um, promised ministry, incidentally, of what Jesus will do with the Spirit of God uh, in Mark chapter 1. So I'll take you there, if you will, in Mark 1 and just read with me the first few verses, first 11 verses of Mark 1. Where Mark begins, not with the birth of Jesus like Matthew does or Luke, but he begins with the full tilt ministry of the promised Elijah, John the baptizer who would come, and according to Isaiah's prophecy, be the messenger. And so the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. For John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. In other words, it was a Holy Spirit operation. People were convicted. And they needed to be because John's ministry was to say, the Messiah is coming, prepare for Him. Prepare for Him in terms of your lifestyle and how you're thinking and what you're doing with your lives. And so, in verse 6, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. You can always tell a prophet of God, can't you? They eat locusts and wild honey and they wear odd clothing. Camel's hair and... War I'm, I'm, I'm kidding you here. This is not a modern day prophet. But nonetheless, he was clothed very much like, if you went to the Old Testament, how Elijah the prophet was clothed in camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. I don't know whether Elijah ate locusts and wild honey or not. You know, the problem with eating locusts is their, their legs get caught in your teeth. That would be a real problem. No wonder you took honey to, to have lunch with locusts. Anyway, I'm just thinking. Anyway, he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so, in the baptism of Jesus, still in Mark 1, verse 9, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Trinity. There's always a Trinitarian formula when it comes to baptism in the New Testament. Yes, there is. It's always there. That's why in um, Matthew 28, um, Jesus, after the resurrection, says to his disciples uh, at the end of Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And so, in the ministry of John the baptizer, the Trinity is present. The baptism of Jesus, the Trinitarian formula is used there. And my point is this. In the ministry of Jesus Christ, you will always find the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He will, Jesus says, not glorify Himself, but He will glorify the Lord Jesus. And so, in that ministry of power... He comes to the disciples by means of the promise that God had given. As John says, 
I may baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Matthew's gospel adds, and with fire. In other words, there is the power of presence, and there is the power of judgment in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He is his own person. He's not the Father. He's not the Son. But he is in complete unity with those two entities of the Trinity. That's a concept that's hard to explain to people. Of course it is, because we don't know anything about unity when it comes to three persons functioning as one. We have no idea how that works. Not in a church nor outside the church. Not in the ministry or some other place. We don't understand what that kind of unity is like. And so in that ministry, Acts 1 says to us, I'm sorry, I'm back in Acts chapter 1, that there is such a thing as the promise of the presence of the Spirit and as he comes, he will produce something for us. And not only his own presence and miracles and people coming to Christ and people being convicted for their sins because, uh, you know, we live in a day and time when I, I don't see much of people being convicted for their sins. We, uh, we seem to have a shield around us. So that however we're living, we think it's okay. I'm not sure where it comes from, but it's not the Holy Spirit. So if you want to draw close to the Lord, <laughs> if you want to grow in Him, and that is a real major factor when it comes to the life and the work of the Spirit of God in this world. If you want to grow spiritually in Him, something has to happen to you. Something has to take place in me and you. We, we cannot live as normal people. We cannot just live because we want to do this or that or the other. It has to be under the permission of the Spirit of God. Most people that you know will not live that way, nor want to live that way. And so, the whole reason, of course, being they have a problem when it comes to their relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have a terrible problem with the Spirit of God, you firstly have a terrible problem with the person of Jesus Christ because those of us who come to him well uh, John chapter 15 comes to my mind and uh, in the last few verses of John the gospel of John chapter 15 um, and uh, let me start with verse 24 where Jesus says if I had not done among them the works that no one else did they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. He's talking about the Sanhedrin council and the leadership of the Jews. In verse 25 of John 15, But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. And now he quotes that promise. They hated me without a cause. People left to their own devices can work up a terrible hatred against spiritual things, against God Himself. But in verse 26, but when the, my translation says, when the Helper comes, you may have the Comforter or the Counselor. We're talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, um, and if you'll go with me um, to verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, Jesus is saying, for if I do not go away, the Helper, the Counselor, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in Me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you'll see Me no more. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. In other words, they... He judges because of sin because the primary problem that all of us have is are we living in faith in Jesus Christ? 
Have we surrendered our life to Him? If not, we're living in a terrible state of mind. And so he says, because they don't believe in me, He will convict them. That may be you. I remember a time when that was me. <laughs> I, I, I thought I believed them. You know, I knew all the information. That was really important for my mother to make sure I knew all the information. We were raised in a church, and so it was important for us to get the information. And when I was 12 years old, she decided that I needed to get baptized because, well, I was already a Christian. I knew the information. I went into the baptismal pool, um, a little snot and a sinner, and I came up out of the baptismal pool, a bigger snot and a bigger sinner. I knew it had not happened. Something hadn't happened. Something hadn't taken place. And of course it hadn't because it wasn't actually a real faith. It wasn't a surrendering of my life to Christ. That's when you come up out of the baptismal pool with a certain hallelujah on your lips, you know. <laughs> That's when you come knowing that you have been forgiven your sins. When you're free. What a wonderful feeling that is. When you're free. I was not free. That transformation happened a little later in my life. And so, the Holy Spirit comes and says to us, if you want to be free, you're going to figure, have to figure out what to do about you because you're going to have to surrender your life. You're going to have to surrender your life. Not just get forgiveness for your sins. You're going to have to surrender how you're living, how you're thinking. And so he says, Righteousness, the Spirit of God convicts us of our lack of righteousness. We don't have any righteousness, you understand. And then, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The ruler of this world, you know who that is, don't you? The Scripture says that's Satan, the adversary, the devil. Yeah. You and I don't want to go where he's going. Nobody in their right mind says, you know what I need is a little more hell in my life. That's what I really need. That would make me happy. Nobody in their right mind says that. Because the Spirit of God's whole authority and ministry on this earth is to bring us out from under judgment. Out from under our sinfulness. Out from under our lack of wanting to know the Lord. Brings us out from under all that ignorance. All of that arrogance of personality and brings us to a place of a quiet submission of our life to Christ. Doesn't make us perfect. Doesn't make us even wonderful at times. Well, it made me wonderful, but maybe it didn't you. But it, it doesn't make us somebody else. We're still us. That's one of our problems in life is even though you've come to Christ, you're still us. You know, it's, that's, you have to deal with that. Uh, the, the way... The way uh, God led me to deal with that as I married a woman who would be a wonderful person and that would give me a goal to move toward in my life, you understand. Um, um, I didn't know you're supposed to tell people I love you a lot until I got married to this woman, you know. Um, I didn't know you had to hug people a lot. You know, that wasn't in my, that wasn't how I worked. But, um, but she does hug a lot. Yes, she does. And um, so it was a wonderful, a wonderful change of my life to marry somebody who was not me, <laughs> who was bigger than me, who was deeper than I was, who was more loving than I was, kinder than I was. And, um, and she's still kinder than I was, tell you the truth, still now. But I'm just, I, let me hurry on because I'm making myself look bad here. Uh, let, me, let me hurry on to say to you, the Spirit of God convicts us of our sin, convicts us because we need desperately the righteousness of God and we don't own it, we don't have it. And concerning judgment because... Well, Satan is judged, and you just don't want to go with him. That's all. You don't want to live with him. No, no. No, no. And so in verse 12 of John 16, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. No, because a lot of the subjects regarding the Spirit of God and His gifts and His power will come by means of the apostles of the church. Not Jesus. He didn't have enough time yet in his life to teach all that he needed to teach. And so the apostles of the church became the foundation teaching of the Word in the church. And so he says, when the Spirit of truth comes, I'm in verse 13 of John 16, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He'll speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. 
And he will glorify me. That's what Jesus says. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And all that the Father has is mine. And therefore I said, he'll take what's mine and declare it to you. Well, perfect access to the mind of the Father. And to the mind and the will of the Son of God. The Spirit of God brings those to us in this life. In this time. In this place. So I'm hurrying on uh, to talk with you out of Acts chapter 1 about the promise of the Lord to us. The promise of the Father. That's what he calls it in Acts 1 and uh, verse 4. The promise of the Father. Wait for the promise of the Father. For he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What a wonderful thing to happen. Here's the essence of the presence that Christ is promising. You are not left to your own devices. You and I are not on our own. I am so glad to be able to tell you that. You don't have to get righteous. You just have to surrender your life to Christ. And the Spirit of God will enable you. He will help you. He will direct you. You will not become a perfect individual because, well... The only people that I've met who thought they were perfect, I, I really didn't want them in my church. But what I'm just saying to you that right now in this life, we have a way for the Spirit of God to come. And the promise of the Father is you will receive His presence. You will re- receive His power. Not an arrogant thing. Not a control issue. That's not what the Spirit of God does with people. Ever so often I meet Christians who want to be in control over everybody they meet. But that is not of the Spirit of God. <laughs> and no, that's a, that's a personal problem that we need to deal with, you know. Um, and, and so the Spirit of God is able to come to us with the presence of the Lord. And to bring to us, as Jesus says in Acts 1, um, it, it, when He says, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. The Father is fixed by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. There is a powerfulness that comes to us. I think that has to come because if people ever actually get up out of the ditch in which they perhaps have been raised, out of the influences of people, maybe even parents, who were not people of the Lord, who laughed at God and His promises. If we're ever able to come to the, to the place where the Lord controls the negatives of our life, how we were raised, who raised us, what did they do to us, what do they still do to us? And so in that light, the Spirit of God is able to come and bring a certain presence into our life, into our very households. I remember meeting in my young Christian days people who were full of the Lord. I couldn't really explain why they were so different than me. <laughs> I just knew they were. Some of it was because I suspicioned they had gray hair and at that time I did not. I suspicioned that they were um, people who had lived with the Lord for a while and, and they had. But you know, my goodness... I meet people today who've been in the Lord 40 years and they're just children in spiritual things. You know, they, they think they're 70. They're actually six years old. They're jealous when everybody else is jealous. They're selfish when everybody else is selfish. Um, they say evil things when they need to watch their mouth. Uh, those are not growing people in the Lord. Those are not people who experience the power of the Spirit of God. There is a changing that happens with us when the Spirit of God comes. There is a presence. And so that power that comes enables us to be witnesses. Well, you know, it's not fair for people who consider themselves to be Christians to talk a lot about heaven and to live like hell. That cannot go together. Something is terribly wrong with us. When we're wanting to go left, and God says you need to be going right. 
What is that issue about us? I know what it is. You know what it is. We're still in charge. We want our way. <laughs> we, we, we're riding this horse. It's our horse. <laughs> and the Lord says, you need to get off your horse and get on your knees. Sort of like um, George Washington at Valley Forge. In a terrible situation. Losing men out of his army. Desertion and people simply going home to take care of their families in a terrible winter. He didn't have the force he needed to follow through with what had to happen when it came to his war with the British. And so he got off his wonderful white horse and got on his knees in the snow and surrendered his life and prayed that the Lord would move in his army, move in his life, accomplish what only God could do in this little nation struggling for its life. And things began to change. You and I are in those positions, not in a national way as Washington, but in a private way. All of us are in a place of needing the power of the Spirit of God to come. None of us have it together. None of us are righteous. It doesn't matter what minister you know and what you're, who you're talking to, who, who seems to know the Word of God. None of us have our act together. All of us are struggling to follow through with what God wants in our lives. All of us have to have the power of the Spirit of God to enable us to become what we want to become, what we want to do, where we want to go, how we want to live. It is the Spirit of God who is enabling. And so, in that enabling, He says, there is wonderful power of the Lord for you to become something more than you are, meaning for you to become a witness, for you to become a person who actually lives by their life to witness to people about who Jesus Christ is. Not just talk. The world's full of talk, isn't it? Not just talk. To live it out. To, to see it work. To see your household changed. To see your children changed, for that matter. Um, to, to see us changed in such a way that the presence of the Spirit of God is able to live His life through us. This is a mighty challenge for people. It is, a, it is a terrible thing to not only be a hypocrite, but to be told you're a hypocrite by your own children. It's a terrible thing to realize that you are not up to what God wants in your life. And it is a human failing, believe me. And so, what happens to us is, in uh, Acts 1, verse 9, when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up in a cloud, took him out of their sight, Christ's ascension. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? <laughs> this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And you know what that means. You saw him physically leave and he will physically return. You will see him just like that. And then they returned from... To, uh, then they returned... I'm in verse 12. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying. You know the upper room, that famous place where Jesus served the last supper with them, the Passover setter meal, where they hid uh, while Jesus was crucified. And after the resurrection, where they were gathered in their unbelief, and Jesus came and appeared to them in that room and said to them that in a wonderful way, peace be with you. And so there they were gathered in the upper room. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James and in verse 14 all of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Boy there's a story behind every single name that is mentioned in this passage in Acts chapter 1 where they were, how they got there, what had to happen in them 
Just, just talking about Mary's children, Jesus' brothers, is a whole other message in itself. And how they had lived their lives in rebellion against the fact that Jesus, their older brother, half-brother at least, as they understood, uh, was the Son of God. He actually was somebody whom they needed to worship. <laughs> you know, tell a brother that his brother needs to be worshipped, and I'm sure there's a cause of rebellion there. And so, in other words, there they were gathered in the upper room, having come to faith in Christ. Having come to faith in Christ. In fact, Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 that one of the six appearances he lists in, in 1 Corinthians 15 is James, the Lord's brother. It had such an impact on him, of course, as Jesus came to him after the resurrection. I guess you'd have to be really stupid and blind not to figure out that he is needing to be worshipped now. He has raised from the dead. But in other words, James, it was so impactful upon him that he became the pastor of the Jerusalem church. In other words, the apostles who were gathered in Jerusalem like Peter and John and James were under the authority of the pastor of the Jerusalem church who was James who wasn't picked as an apostle, that wasn't the point. He had come to the place of authority. He had come to the place of believing authority, and he was picked as the pastor of the Jerusalem church. And incidentally, in something like 62 AD, we're pretty firm on those dates, James died a martyr's death in Jerusalem, friends. Yeah, in Jerusalem. And so... What are we saying here in these verses in Acts 1? And that is the presence of Christ is coming. The only people who are not afraid of the presence of Christ coming again in a physical way are people who have surrendered their life to Him. There are Christians who may be afraid <laughs> of His coming because of the way they're living now. What a shame. But the truth of the matter is it won't stop Him. <laughs> we can't stop Him. He's coming. And one of the great powers of the Spirit of God in the presence of Christians is to convict us over and over again that He is coming. He is coming. Live your life in accordance with this. Now what if He doesn't come in my lifetime? And I've gone around preaching for years, Jesus Christ is coming. Well, does that mean that it was all ridiculous? Well, of course not. It just simply means that He's waiting on you. That's all. <laughs> He's waiting on you to come to Christ. He's waiting on you and you to come to a place of surrendering in your life before He comes again. We have this plan that the Spirit of God is working on to bring power into our lives by remembering that we are not only His witnesses, we are expecting for His presence to come to us personally into this world and to live our lives accordingly. And as I hurry on, let me say to you out of Acts 1, uh, where all these people were gathered in the upper room, all these with one accord were gathered together, devoting themselves to prayer. The life of the church is powerful because the life of the church is prayerful. Prayerful. Did I say that clearly enough that you can hear this? Full of prayer. But wait a minute. If the power of the presence of the Lord is coming, the, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit's power is upon us, why are we in such dire straits sometimes? Why do we still need money? Why do we still need our families to come to Christ? Why do we still have to have the Lord delivering us from this or that? It is because we are living in a sinful world and He hasn't come again yet. But what he has done is to send his Holy Spirit's power. His Holy Spirit's presence. That doesn't mean that you and, and I are walking around in the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep in mind, the way Jesus illustrated this in the New Testament is, as John the baptizer baptized you in water, that's what John said, even though I have baptized you, John said, in water, if you kind of picture for a minute the muddy little Jordan River, it's a sorry little river. Uh, it's, it's not impressive. I was raised on the Mississippi, and that's impressive, but the Jordan is not impressive. It's kind of like uh, Chickamauga Creek in a lot of places. And so, uh, dirty little water. Uh, 
had a friend who came to Christ in our church who decided that he wanted to be baptized in Tiger Creek here in Ringo. Have you seen Tiger Creek? <clears throat> yep. Um, the first thing he had to do was drive the snakes away so that we could actually get him in the water <laughs> and immerse him in the water of that creek. It was not impressive, but it's what he wanted to do, and that was fine with me. Uh, it's not the water anyway, is it? Whether it's muddy or it's clear, who really cares? But nonetheless, 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 John's baptizing with water in the Jordan River. And so you would be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not in the Jordan River. Thank God. You'll be baptized in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Has that been your experience? <laughs> Uh, has it been your experience truly? Have you been baptized in the onflowing, powerful presence of the Spirit of God? That's what changes your life, folks. That's what moves us from being selfish to being a generous Christian. That's what moves us into the love of God's Word, into the power that makes us witnesses in this world. Baptized in the onflowing presence of the power of God. That's the promise. Now in the scriptures, that happens in the church in Acts chapter 2. And I guess there's Bible teachers who think that that's the only time it ever was going to take place. But the truth of the matter is, we recognize Pentecost, not just as the Jewish gathering that it was 50 days after Passover, but we celebrate it as the moving of the Spirit of God upon the church to make it powerful and a witness and to bring people to the place where they would witness for Christ even if it meant martyrdom in their life. But the Pentecostal experience is an ongoing flow. It isn't just a one time only in history, friends. It is what makes the church powerful today. It is what brings the presence today that is powerful in your life. It is what changes people. That presence of the Spirit of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit's presence of God, moves upon us, that empowering of the Lord to make us somebody else, to change how we're thinking, to move how we're, how we're living, to realize for us that Christ's presence is the most precious and personal thing that He has left for us to realize and recognize. This moving of God's Holy Spirit upon us. And when He has come, the Spirit of truth has come, Jesus says, He will glorify me. <laughs> that may not be how your life is being lived. I don't know, but it may not be that you're busy glorifying Jesus Christ with the decisions that you're presently making. But listen, you can turn around. You remember, John 16 says, the Spirit of God has come to convict us of our sin and our need for righteousness and the fact that we want to out from under all the judgment that is upon the enemy. Of course, the Spirit of God is able to come and glorify Christ in our lives. You can turn around. God knows I've turned around more times than, than 20, where we are busy living our own lives and doing our own thing, and God comes to us and says, is this really how you want to live your life? Is this really fulfilling? Is this what you need? Honestly, a lot of things take over. Money, power, control, lust. A lot of things take over. But the presence of the power of the Spirit of God brings us close to Jesus. Brings us to this place where you will be my witnesses. Where you will have this loving kindness overtake your life. <laughs> so that you become what you've always wanted to become. By means of the power of Christ. We're going to talk more about the Spirit of God as we go along in these weeks. I don't know when congregations will return to their buildings when it comes to church on Sundays. I'm not really sure about that. Next Sunday's Mother's Day. Um, <laughs> I was kind of hoping that maybe we could crank up 
with people coming into our congregation on Mother's Day. I'm not so sure that's going to happen yet. Um, but I know you're praying about that, and so am I. Let me leave you with this certain promise of the Lord. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. In other words, on the Lord. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because, here's the principle, because he trusts in thee. King James English, quoting out of Isaiah 26, verse 3. Father, we pray together for the promise of the Spirit of God to be recognized upon us. Even if we're trying to live it alone and on our own presence, our own power, we are absolutely without the ability. And so we're praying that as we receive your power, may the Spirit of God come to turn us into witnesses, to bring us to a place where we become something we are not yet now. That we would look to how the Spirit of God will work with us. In Christ we're praying now. Amen.